Okay, in this uh, vodcast for it's Pax Romana Part 2, we're going to discuss the reign of Octavian, later known as Caesar Augustus, or Augustus Caesar, and his successors. Here's Rome, AD 14, which is the last year of Caesar Augustus, aka Octavian's life, to 284 uh, AD. It's big. And that's the big problem that Octavian faces when he returns home from Egypt to start to sit down and effectively try to rule Rome as an empire. The Republic has fallen. The government that Octavian inherits uh, was in tatters. Men like Marius, Sala, Julius Caesar, they had destroyed the prestige and power of the Senate and Rome's old nobility. Uh, there was a belief that Rome had just grown too big, too powerful, too many possessions, and there was really no leadership there. So, Octavian arrives in Rome from Egypt in about 29 BC. Uh, he's unchallenged. His enemies are dead. He controls all of Rome's army. He had all the riches from Egypt that he could possibly want. Um, he could have really turned into one of these guys that we've seen before, these tyrants who are selfish, who are looking for their self-interest and the interests of their army alone. But he doesn't. Uh, and ultimately what we get is no more republic, we're a Roman Empire. So let's talk Octavian. He restores the old institutions of the republic. But, it is very important to understand this, guys. The institutions are intact but how they are run and operated are very different. He, Octavian, is the one in charge of these institutions. Any of the unsuitable senators, um, guys that were too corrupt, or if he deemed them unsuitable, uh, he got rid of. He basically comes up with a three-tier criteria for who is going to be a senator. First one, military service. Makes sense. If you're going to have people in a powerful position in the Senate, um, have them be in, or coming from the military. After all, Octavian was in charge of the entire military. So basically, the general Octavian is appointing his sergeants and privates to positions of political power in the Senate. However, it's not seen as like Julius Caesar was with packing the Senate. This is seen as a good move by most Romans uh, to sort of weed out the corrupt senators. There's a lot of anger and frustration amongst the Roman people at this time. They want to make sure that the glory of Rome is there. Octavian is making that happen. Uh, also, personal qualities are involved, just hey, who they are, you know, the eye test for people, and financial standing. If they were broke, if they were in debt, if they owed money, they're not getting in. Why? Well, they'll be more easily corrupted because they, hey, they got bills to pay. Now in 27 BC, so he's been in Rome, you know, making his making his changes for about two years. Uh, he gets a little nervous and he decides, well, I gotta do something. You know, I don't want to be seen as a guy like Julius Caesar. So it's called the gift, in quotations there, of power. He gives everything to the Senate, everything he possesses, all his power, all of his. Um, all of the land that he conquers, all the provinces that he is in control of, command of the armies, as, as once he returns, I should have said this, Octavian is actually not like named emperor or dictator for life or anything. He's actually elected consul in charge of the military. He gives it all up. He gives it to the Senate. Now, this is a ceremonial gesture because ultimately the Senate just turns right around and gives it right back to him. But it's important to understand the perspective that Octavian was trying to put forward. He doesn't want to be seen as a taker. What he wants to be um, looked at as is a receiver of the Roman Empire. Very different than somebody that just takes it and grabs that power. Ultimately, after this, the Senate really diminishes in power. Okay, Out of all the groups in Roman society, it's the plebeians that lose out the most. The assemblies really become non-factors in any sort of decisions as well, you know, the Senate pretty much does too, although the Senate's held in much higher regard. The Senate really becomes a law court, sort of the day-to-day -day operations of, okay, let's make sure Rome runs smoothly and, you know, take care of all that. Everything else, 
it's pretty much Octavian. Now the Senate can still advise Octavian. They're still there. They're still held in prestige by the Emperor, at least under Octavian. Uh, but as far as their final say decision making, man, they really don't have it. He is, after this symbolic gesture, given the title of Augustus. This is how Octavian becomes Caesar Augustus. Caesar, you know, dating back to Julius Caesar. Because uh, he comes from that family. And Augustus means venerable. Venerable is it's good. Augustus is pretty much known as a radical conservative. That's an oxymoron. They don't fit. Radicals want rapid change in a hurry, stuff that doesn't resemble the past, and conservatives are the exact opposite, to conserve, to keep things the way that they are. He is looking to conserve the old qualities that made Rome great, but he's doing it in a radical way by reshaping how Rome operates. The Republic is dead. Nobody is even alive anymore that even remembers or has even heard of remembering how the Roman Republic actually used to function and function well. So, you know, all these ideas of the Roman Federation that we talked about in the Roman Republic in class, nobody really gets it anymore. Okay, they look at this this big system, this complex system of checks and balances and assemblies and tribunes and tenkra sanctity and imperium and they say we need to do something to change this. Okay? Uh, there are several things that he does to sort of keep the old while doing it quickly. First off, takes a look at the mythology and says, we can fix this. Uh, he builds and resource temples all throughout Rome. He really focuses on Rome and really tries to build up that infrastructure, make it that gleaming light in the Roman Empire that he wants it to be. Uh, he names himself Pontifex. Maximus, the chief priest in about 12 BC, I believe. Um, so he's in charge of the religion. So he's economically in charge, pretty much. He's in charge of foreign affairs. He's in charge of military. And now he's influencing social society and culture. This brings us to the Augustan age. He's head of state for 40 years plus. Um, most of the power is with him. And he creates the Praetorian Guard. If you remember back to what a Praetor is, you drop the I-A-N here. A Praetor was the assistant to the consuls. These Praetorians end up becoming the Emperor's bodyguards. Oftentimes what we're going to see is they play a role in future Emperors. Because they'll, in, in some respects, insulate Emperors. And sort of, they get sort of out of touch. They can be corrupt at times, but it's very important and very influential. Um... A lot of times, emperors have to worry about carrying favor with this Praetorian Guard because ultimately they have a lot of sway within the military ranks. He helps bring peace to the West, particularly Gaul and Spain. He shows up there with his army. That's how. Uh, he does have a series of conquests that push the border to the Danube River in northern and eastern Europe. However, most of his military is going to be solely focused on strengthening the existing borders of Rome uh, and actually taking care of Rome, the city itself, the capital. He creates police force, fire brigades, talk about food, water, began building programs, tried over moral religious reforms, um, and it's a great period of cultural activity. Okay, uh, He's a popular ruler. He begins stockpiling not just food, but also even uh, money. Uh, the interesting thing is coinage. He starts making his own coins, starting a new Roman tradition where the emperors are actually on the coins. Before this, most of the time it was just um, gods and goddesses that were on the coins. But he puts his own likeness on his, on his own coinage. My kingdom, my kingdom... A son for my kingdom. Augustus died at AD 14. Uh, relatives rule the empire, either the Julios, the Caesars, 
Julius Caesar's, um, or the Claudians, which is Augustus's wife, for about 54 years. Now, the problem here with the death of Caesar Augustus is he wants to name an heir. He names several heirs, but they keep dying on him. Ultimately, the man that inherits this empire is Tiberius. Tiberius is he's pretty old by the time he takes over. He's in his 50s, I believe. Uh, he's a good soldier. He's a competent administrator. He sort of maintains. Um, he, he, he's been groomed somewhat by Caesar Augustus, even though he definitely wasn't his first, second, or third choice to succeed him. Uh, but he's pretty competent. Now, if you look at some of the later ones, I'm not going to go through each of them, but I got Caligula and Nero here. Uh, Caligula, not good. Uh, he starts out good. He lowers taxes. He becomes very, he becomes popular with the people. Um, he revives elections. He starts finishing a lot of the public building projects that had been started before him. However, he falls ill, and after this illness, he gets a fever and he becomes mentally unstable for the rest of his reign. Uh, he becomes completely paranoid. Uh, I have there, he appointed his favorite horse as consul. He said it was the only person that he trusted. Uh, yeah, he is the definition of cuckoo. He declares himself a god. Um, he actually declares himself as the only god. He says, let there be one lord, one king. So he's the only one. Um, he starts executing members of the Senate that he doesn't like. Um, he was known for just being very, very cruel. Um, he, he would, um, put people on, or execute people without it, putting them on trial. Just terrible stuff. Uh, he's known for having shall we say, uh, inappropriate relationships uh, with his three sisters. Um, it's just terrible, terrible stuff from Caligula. But, despite it all, this Roman Empire survives. You know, we have a lot of bad emperors from time to time, but for the most part, Rome just keeps on rolling. Probably because it's just so big. Um, that even just one person, even if they were emperor, just couldn't take this thing down. Nero's another one. Um, there's a Jewish revolt in the Middle East. He puts that down. Nero's mother, Agrippina, had um, worked very hard her entire life to position Nero as the heir to this empire. And then after he becomes emperor, he kills his own mother because she says she's a distraction. Nero actually kills his first wife. And then he turns around and um, marries uh, his friend's wife who had helped him kill his first wife. I, the guy's crazy. During Nero's reign, there was a large fire in Rome. Uh, many people blamed, actually, Nero for the fire. Uh, the old saying, you know, while Rome burned, Nero fiddled. Uh, just standing there playing with his fiddle. Uh, he had huge works projects for his own palace, while Rome was sort of cl crumbling around him. Uh... By AD 68, Nero, last of the Julio Claudians, um, he commits suicide. The Flavians end up uh, taking over. Following Nero's death, we get a period of civil wars in Rome. Uh, there are rebellions. They're saying, you know, listen, after this, this, you know, chain of sort of less than successful emperors, we've got problems. Uh, for military leaders, we have various claims to the throne. Um, Jerusalem gets destroyed in the process under the Flavians. The Flavians are ultimately um, not good emperors. Uh, so that brings us to the good emperors. AD 96, the new line of emperors established the good emperors. Five rulers governed Rome for almost a century from the provinces different than Rome to opening Roman imperial society. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next podcast. Uh, we're going to try and figure out why the five good emperors were five good emperors. Thanks for listening.